yeah, last time we talked about the Hopfield network, and so what I want to uh, say today about Hopfield networks is just an, a mathematical analysis, um, a simplified version of it, uh, which shows that there is this phase transition. We have seen in the demo that um, as long as the number of patterns that we store is small enough, everything works quite well. So we can, st we can store these patterns and then we can, uh, we can use as an input um, noisy patterns with some errors in it and uh, then if we then start the Hopfield dynamics it will converge to one of the stored patterns. But as soon as the number of patterns gets too large, then the whole thing uh, ends up in a chaotic state. Yeah? Which means uh, I can impose a noisy pattern, but it will not converge to one of the learned patterns. Rather, it will converge to some, uh, to some pattern and it turns out, and I showed you this, if you look at, yeah, at, at these states, these are stable states. So if you, for example, input this noisy pattern, the whole network will converge to, to this pattern. And even with, with different noisy patterns, you will quite often get this pattern. Look here, if you input this two and this uh, three, it will end up in, uh, with this stable uh, state. It's a stable state, even though it's not one of the training patterns. Uh. So that's, that's what happens if the number of stored patterns gets too large. And for example, in this little network, uh, if you train 10 patterns, this is already uh, kind of critical. Okay, and now I want to give you some understanding about this problem. And let's start uh, with this formula again. This is the learning rule for the Hopfield networks. So that means, I mean, this is a type of lazy learning because what we do is uh, so our vector Q, this upper index K is the, the number of the training pattern. So I take training pattern number K and what I, <coughs> what I then do is to compute the, the weight WIJ, which is the weight between the neurons I and J. So then I multiply QI times QJ. Huh? So, yeah, so we need we need the, the correlations between all pairs of the components of the input pattern. Yeah? So, and maybe, maybe, yes, let's look at um, such a training pattern. Suppose we train the number two here. Um, and now these, these products, Q, I, Q, J, so the vector the vector of the QI, this Q vector, is this is the first, second, third, and so on component. And so, for example, the product Q1, Q2 is equal to 1 because they have the same value. So they are both plus 1 or minus 1, and the product is positive. And also the product between two of the white um, uh, components they are both minus one and so the product is positive. So all, all the, the bits with the same value, they lead to a positive product. And all the bits with a different value, for example these two or this one and this one, they lead to a negative uh, product. And that's what, what happens in this sum. That's what happens during learning. And that's how I get these weights. And in this, uh, in this example, where we have uh, uh, a 10 by 10 matrix, 
which is 100 neurons, there we get 100 times 99 divided by 2 is 4950 weights. Huh? That's how we get these weights. I mean, that's not new. We talked about this last time. <coughs> and now let's look at the dynamics, yes. Here again, uh, let's look at the, the, this formula. Um, so we store our weights with this, with this formula and then we, we uh, put a new pattern on our, um, on our matrix, which is on our neural network. Huh? So such a vector x um, now is, is used as an input for the network and then we apply this dynamics infinitely, in an infinite loop. Huh? So the update rule, our xi is minus 1 if, and now look at this sum. This is the weighted sum of all the inputs to neuron number i. Yeah? Why, why, why do we have all the inputs? Because here, this is the weight wij. This weight connects neuron i to neuron j. Yeah? And, uh, of course, it's multiplied by the output value or by the current value of neuron J. Yeah? Um, and now, of course, we have to uh, take the sum. So this is this, the weighted sum of all the inputs to neuron number I. And if this weighted sum is negative, then the output will be minus 1, otherwise it will be plus 1. So you see, in each one of these update steps, every neuron uh, behaves like a perceptron. With the only difference that the output now is not 0 and 1, it's minus 1 and plus 1. Okay. Okay, we have seen this uh, in, the, in the demo, how it, how it evolves. And I mean, here you can again see how many steps it takes. We take this as an input with 10% noise and after 379 steps, uh, the network converges to one of the training patterns. Huh? Um, and you see it takes here in this example between 300 and 400 steps. Okay, and now, but now let's go to the analysis. Um, yes, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this looks like uh, many indices in, in the formula, but it's not too difficult. Huh? Um, yeah, let's start with this formula here. Um, I mean, this formula, this is what happens during the dynamics of the network. Yeah? So, um, yes, and what, what I do now is, I put an input, I put a certain pattern on the network. And what I put on the network is one of the trained patterns with no noise. Yeah? So, and I use our training pattern number Q1. I use the first training pattern. It doesn't matter, I could use any training pattern uh, with some index, but uh, to make it a little bit simpler, I use training pattern number one. Okay, and um, so what happens in, in one step in neuron number I, in neuron I, it computes the weighted sum of all the inputs over the whole network. This is the weighted sum of all uh, inputs to neuron number i. Huh? Okay, so that's really simple. That's, uh, that's being computed. And now what we now do is we use the formula for the weights wij which we just have seen. Let's go back a few slides. <coughs> Here. Now we replace WIJ by exactly this formula. That's, that's all we do. 
Okay, we replace this WIJ by our training formula. So that's how this uh, WIJ comes from learning. Huh? Um, yeah, that's the formula. And so now you see uh, from this single sum we get now a double sum where the inner sum um, uh, loops over all the training patterns uh, for k equal 1 to capital N. Okay, um, and now what we now do is we split up this inner sum. We split this inner sum up into two parts. The first part, or let's say we take out of this sum, we take, the, we take out of the sum the first term for k equal 1. Uh, and this is, this is what we have here. Huh? Look, for k equal 1, why do we use k equal 1? Because it, because it makes it simpler. For k equal 1, we get qi um, 1 squared. That's what we get here. Huh? So this is the first term out of the sum. And the rest of the sum is what we had here. But we start the index with k equal 2. So that's not really difficult. And why do we take the first term out of the sum? Because this is the pattern we imposed on the network now. Okay, so we get qj1 squared. But these qj, they are all plus or minus 1. So the square of this is plus 1. So it's 1, so we can just omit this. And that's why we get this here. Okay, yeah. But uh, how, how, how do we uh, discard this sum? I mean, what we have here now is the sum over j equal 1 to n of qi1. Yeah? So you see, this qi1 is a constant inside the sum. So we can take it out of the sum. So we can just, I mean, this is being uh, deleted because it's 1. And now this is constant, so we can take it out of the sum. Okay? So what remains here, I mean, we are talking about this part of the whole thing. Uh, in, a, in a minute we will talk about the second part. Okay. And now um, we take the qi in front of the sum, and now we get a, a 1 inside here, and what remains is this sum, okay? Now let's look at this, this blue formula. 1 over n times the sum over j equal 1 to n over 1. What is this? What is this whole thing? One. It is 1, yes, why? Yes, yes, you're right. It's, um, so if this is a sum with n terms, and uh, it's a sum over n times 1, it's n times 1, which is 1. But actually, it is not n times 1. Because here it says j not equal to i. So it's n minus 1 times 1. So what we get out of here is n minus 1 times 1. And then in front of the sum there is this 1 over n. So you see we get n minus 1 divided by n, which for large n is approximately equal to 1. OK. Um, yes. So we should, uh, yeah, so this is not, not perfectly correct here. Uh, so this should be an approximately, yeah? it's not exactly equal. Okay, so now we have understood this first term here. Um, and yes, let's uh, delete this. 
And let's look at the second term. Yeah, what happens with the second term? Nothing. It just remains here. But, I mean, here now we can see what happens. So we get, even with one step of the iteration, a reproduction of this first term, huh? uh, of, the, of the stall pattern. So what we have here is our stall pattern. But, of course, there is this sum. I mean, it would be nice if we could show that this whole rest is equal to zero. Then everything would be perfect, but that's not possible. This term is typically non-zero. Let's look what we have here. So we have, um, this is my new input pattern, QJ1. But this is multiplied by such products QI, QJ. So again we have these correlations among the different neurons in our network. And these may have arbitrary values. So the, the result of this inner sum may be some arbitrary value. Huh? And then we have this outer, no sorry, uh, the result, yeah. I mean we can exchange these two sums. If we take the outer sum inside and we look at the result of this sum what we have then inside, it may be some arbitrary value. And then we take the this sum over all the patterns, over all the training patterns, and it may even more be an arbitrary value. And that's not so nice. If we add to our stored pattern some arbitrary value, then of course the result may be an arbitrary value. But now the idea in the following of the proof is, um, yeah, I mean, we look, we look at um, one component of our stored pattern. We, we used stored pa the stored pattern number one and we look at the ith component, at one bit of our stored pattern. That's where we look. And such, uh, such one, uh, one bit, we can just look at it um, on the axis of the real numbers. So we do have a zero here, and a minus one here, and a plus one here. Huh? And ideally we would get either this value or that value as an output. Huh? So now suppose this bit number i would be a plus one here. And now what we get here is we have a sum over all the, the patterns, um, and the sum over all these uh, bits and then we divide it by 1 over n. But this is, yeah, I mean this whole thing may have uh, at the end a really large value. Huh? It may, so to this plus 1 I may add uh, a large value, let's just make this longer, and we may end up here. Or we may end up here. Or maybe here. Or here. Um, and now we assume that our stored patterns are random patterns. Uh, if these patterns are random and they are not correlated, if we look at such a pixel image, correlated patterns would be, suppose our pattern number one is this, with vertical stripes, and pattern number two I take a different color in the same picture and pattern number two would be this one. These patterns would be strongly correlated. Yeah? 
Um, but if we use random patterns, they are not correlated. And then the terms in this sum over all patterns, there can kind of random, uh, random terms in the sum. And what happens if we have a sum of random numbers is uh, the result of the sum um, is a Gaussian distribution. Huh? And if these, these terms in the sum, they are all plus or minus one, then the mean, the mean value of the sum, what is then the mean? The expected value of the sum if the terms, they are all plus or minus one, and they are random and uncorrelated. Yeah? Zero. The mean is zero then, okay. So now if, if this first term is a plus one, and the mean of this distribution is zero, um, and the terms are random, then we get a, a probability distribution, and you know it from well, where did we have it in the math lecture? I guess one or two weeks ago. What is the distribution then of, uh, of our sum? It's a Gaussian distribution. Yeah? We get a normal distribution, so this normal distribution has some shape like that. Yeah? And now the question is, what is what is the, the standard deviation? So this would be two sigma here. So what is the standard deviation? If the standard deviation of this distribution of these random terms in the sum is small enough, then we really get as an output our stored pattern. But suppose we have a huge standard deviation, something like that, then of course it may happen that we get a minus one as an output. Huh? Um, and that's not so good. So the question is, what is the standard deviation of this term? Huh? So the mean is a zero if, under the assumption, that these terms are random. Huh? This, uh, I mean, all these proofs can only be done under the assumption that we store random patterns. Huh? Um, but then the mean is zero, and the standard deviation, now that's the question. Uh, and we have seen this, when we looked at the central limit te theorem, we have seen, we know, uh, there is, we know a formula. Who remembers this formula? What is the standard deviation of a sum of n random numbers? or n random variables. Look, sum over i equal 1 to, no, let's, let's use a different number. Let's use a k, no, we do have a k. Let's say l, huh? xl, okay? So now what is the standard deviation of such a sum of l random variables? So, yeah, we call this sum, we give it the name uh, y. Oh, and, and here, of course, we have to use an i <coughs> as an index, yeah. y, let's call it y l, because it's the sum of l random variables. What do you know from the central limit theorem? And suppose all these variables, uh, sigma of x, i, they all do have the same standard deviation, sigma. Huh? Now then, what is our sigma of this new variable y, l? Is it bigger than the original sigma?
you have to repeat this uh, central limit theorem. That's really important, yeah? It's, it's very important for all empirical scientists. So what we then have is the sigma of the sum variable is the square root of L times the original sigma. Huh? Okay? So, and, and that's quite easy. So you just have, we just have to take the length of our sum, the number of terms we have in the sum, which is L, and then we take the square root of the number of the terms. Okay, and now we apply this here to this example. Yeah, look, we take, it's these products that we have in the sum. Huh? These products, they are plus or minus one. Um, yeah. And how many terms do we have in the sum? This is a sum with capital N minus one terms. And this has lowercase n minus one terms. So this sum has n minus one terms. And, and the outer sum gives us a factor of n minus, lowercase n minus one terms. So the whole, th whole sum has um, lowercase n minus one times capital N minus one terms. Yeah? yeah, I mean, that's what you can read here too. Um, and that's why we get a square root of this uh, product as, uh, as the standard deviation of our new variable. Um, okay, and you know, of course the question is, what is the standard deviation of these individual terms? I mean, this is a product of um, plus and minus one values. Huh? Look, these are the values that we have, minus one and plus one. And the standard deviation of such a random variable is equal to one. Huh? So I don't prove this here, but I mean it's, it's obvious that it's, it's around one, this standard deviation. It's exactly one, okay? So then what we get is the standard deviation of this sum of random terms is this value. And because uh, in front of the sum we have this factor 1 over n, so we get uh, this divided by n. And now for large n, um, we can cancel this n minus 1, uh, the, the square root of n minus 1 uh, with this n, and then uh, we get, let's see, yeah, so this cancels out and then here remains uh, square root of n, so that's what we get. Yeah? So we get square root of capital N minus 1 over uh, lowercase n. This is our standard deviation, and now remember, we want to have a small standard deviation. Yeah? So, and when is, this, when is this standard deviation small? It is small if capital N is much smaller than this lowercase n. That's our condition for a small standard deviation. Um, and that means the number of patterns that we store has to be much smaller than this lowercase n. What was lowercase n? Let's go back. Yeah, this is uh, the, the sum over this j from 1 to n. Uh, and you see this lowercase n is the number of bits in our pixel image. Yeah? So if we use uh, 100 bits, then the number of patterns that we store has to be much smaller, not just smaller, it has to be much smaller than 100. And so you can see that 10 stored pattern is already 10% of the number of patterns that, that may already be critical. Uh, um, and also remember, this proof only holds for random patterns. And the patterns we stored in our example, they are not really random. 
I mean, look at these patterns. For example, the 8 and the 0. They are strongly correlated, so they are far from being random. And um, if the patterns are not random, then the number of patterns we can store is even smaller. Why is it even smaller? We can see it if we look at this derivation here. How can we see it that it's worse if the patterns are correlated? <coughs> yeah, look at this sum. Suppose the patterns are strongly correlated. Strongly correlated would mean that all these factors here, in the extreme case, they all have the same sign. So they may all add up uh, to plus one. Yeah? And then the value of this sum may be lowercase n times um, uppercase n divided by this n, so then we get something like our capital N um, as a sum, and then of course this is much bigger than this uh, small standard deviation. Uh, and then we get uh, strong disturbances of our patterns. Uh, um, and that's why in our example the number of patterns that we can store is even smaller than this theoretical limit, yeah? because they are correlated. Okay, but I mean, what we, what we learn from here is just capital N has to be much smaller than lower, lowercase n. But I mean, is there a hard threshold such that we can say, okay, if the number of patterns is less than some value, then it uh, um, it works, and if it is bigger than this value, it doesn't work. Yes, that can be proven. I mean, this simple proof doesn't give us the exact value, but uh, scientists have proven that this is the critical point. So if capital N is less than 0.146 low times our lowercase n, um, it, um, it works. And uh, as soon as it's more than this value, it doesn't work anymore. No? And that's interesting. So it's really a, a sharp phase transition uh, at this threshold. Of course, the phase transition is only sharp if these two ends are uh, big numbers and if the stored patterns are random. Okay, yeah, some other remarks. Uh, yes, okay, so for the example, when we use 100 neurons, up to 14 uncorrelated patterns can be stored. Huh? Um, and of course, the memory capacity is below that of a list memory. Huh? Um, and I don't go into this in detail. That's an, an uh, exercise for you. Just look into take a list memory where you store binary numbers um, and compare it with this storage capacity. Yeah, um, yeah. and, and uh, what's also important, so the formula for the help field network that I presented here, this is the simplest case of the formula. It can be modified a little bit, but with this formula it only works good if our training patterns have approximately 50% uh, black um, and 50% uh, white um, part of the image. Um, so if the number of um, one bits is much bigger than 50% or much lower than 50%, it doesn't work anymore because we don't have this symmetry anymore. Huh? But it, uh, I, I mean, the formulas can be modified such that it works also uh, for non-symmetric images. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the workaround, you see it here, is we use neurons with a uh, threshold. So up to now, the neurons didn't have a threshold, but if we use a threshold, it works. Okay, yeah, summary and outlook. 
Um, I mean, even so, this Hopfield network is very nice, and I mean, it's nice to observe the dynamics. And also, I would say, among the, the currently used uh, neural network models, the Hopfield network is among um, the among those which are closest to our biological um, ideal. Yeah? But it, yeah, I mean, due to this uh, Hopfield dynamics, um, and yeah, especially due to this recurrent nature, we may have loops of activity. Uh, going through the network and these loops may cause really uh, ugly behavior which may be oscillations of values or it may be divergence of values you have seen this local minima problem and all this cannot be understood mathematically very well so this is a uh, that, that's a problem about this model and that's why it's not uh, so it, it doesn't have much uh, many applications in practice. Yeah. Even though in the 1980s the first successes of the Hopfield model they they really caused the enthusiasm in the field of neural networks and they led to uh, quite a large amount of money uh, that went into the research on neural networks and that was good. Okay, yeah, let's, let's, let's now go to easier types of networks. Yeah? So the problem I already mentioned, the problem is as soon as I have, even if it's only uh, three neurons which do have um, bidirectional connections, then we may have loops of information going through and that leads to problems. So what we, what we do now is we, we only look at neural networks anymore which are, uh, they are called feed-forward networks. Something like that. Huh? So we have an, an input coming in here and an output coming out here and the flow of information is only from input units to output units and so uh, no cycles are possible anymore and that makes the whole thing easier okay um, yes so and in the following section we will talk about associative memories yeah? an ordinary memory we call it a list memory um, we can store some patterns and then uh, we can um, we can again load these patterns from the memory yeah? we can store them and then uh, recall them from the memory again uh, but an associative memory has a behavior is we we put some input and then we get some different output we get an association between input and output. As an example, we may have a, a system where as an input you use a picture, maybe a picture of the face of a person and as an output you get the name of this person. Yeah? So then you get an association between the pixel image of the face and the name of the person. Yeah? Okay, yeah. And, yeah, and what's also very important is uh, the big advantage of associative memories is that if you use as an input not the original uh, pixel image but a similar picture, pixel image then you may still get the correct name of the person as an output. So they are fault tolerant. The associative memories, the, the very important property is fault tolerance. We have seen it already in the Hopfield example. Okay, and the easiest type of such a memory it's the so-called correlation matrix memory uh, and sometimes it's also called 
uh, cohonen associative memory. But be careful, there is another type of cohonen uh, neural network, um, the cohonen self organizing maps, which is completely different. So, this is the cohonen associative memory. Yeah? Okay, so now again, we, we sup suppose we have such a set of training data where, where each sample consists of an input pattern and the corresponding output pattern. So the input pattern is called Q from query and the output pattern is uh, it's deno denoted T like target. It's a target value. So I want to have an associative memory that maps Q1 onto T1 up to Qn to Tn. Huh? Okay, and now I mean this is a picture of such a two-layer associative memory. We have an input layer, so we put the input values onto these neurons and then uh, over this fully connected network they will be mapped onto the output layer and then you can read the output from this. And I mean the formula is extremely simple. This is the formula. This is the formula how we get our uh, output vector. So the output vector from pattern number P is we, we put the, the query vector at the input then this will be, will be multiplied with the weight matrix and we get this output vector. So it's just linear algebra. That's it. It's, it's very simple linear algebra. And uh, I mean this is the, the, the vector notation and this is the, the component notation. So the index number i, the output index number i is computed with this formula. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, that's just linear algebra. And the question is, how do we determine this weight matrix? Um, and yeah, here we have the answer. We just use the HEP rule. This is nothing new. It's, a, it's just the HEP rule and it's almost exactly the formula that we used before for the Hopfield network. But of course now it's a little bit different. What's different is we have the input layer and the output layer. Um, so now let's look at this formula. Wij, uh, which is the connection between the output neuron number i and the input neuron number j. So it's, it is one of these um, yeah, output, I mean now here we have j and i, so yeah, we, we, uh, yeah, let's put an i here. So we have the T, I, and Q, Q, um, no. Q, J. Yeah. And this is our uh, weight. Um, Q, uh, W, I, J. Yeah. Okay. And now uh, uh, the formula on the next slide shows us how we determine this weight Wij. We just take the product of Qj times Ti. But uh, not only for one pattern, we compute this product for all the patterns and then we take the sum of all patterns. That's all we do. And that's this formula. You see this sum uh, loops over all the patterns. Okay, so yeah, that's quite simple. And now, of course, the question is, if we determine the weights in this way, will this work? Will this work? What does that mean? I mean, is it then true that from inputting some pattern number p, Will I get the correct target output number P? That's the question. And in order to prove this, 
We need the notion of orthonormal vectors. Two vectors x and y are orthonormal if the scalar product between the two vectors is 1 if and only if the two vectors are the same and otherwise it is 0. Okay, and here we have this theorem. If all n uh, input vectors QP from the training data are, all, are orthonormal, any vector QP multiplied with the matrix W is mapped to the response vector TP. So you see, I mean this theorem says our associative memory is correct under the assumption that our training vectors these Q vectors, they have to be orthonormal. Uh? I mean, this is a quite a strong assumption. Um, the whole thing holds also if they are statistically independent. Um, but then the proof is a little bit more difficult. So just let's look at this proof for the case that these guys are orthonormal. Uh? And what do we do? Uh, the proof is really straightforward and easy. We just compute the weight matrix times some input pattern and then from this product we take the ith component. We take one component and this ith component has of course to be equal to um, the pth uh, target output and the ith component of it. So uh, now we will prove that this is equal to TPI and then we are finished. Okay. Now this uh, product in the component notation is the sum over WIJ QPJ and now I mean what do we do? We do the same thing we did before in a hope field network. We take the formula we use to train our WIJ and uh, so WIJ what did we have? Let's look. Yeah, we, we use, we, we replace WIJ by exactly this sum. And that's what we have here. No? Um, okay, and again you see we have these triples, uh, these, these two input uh, values and uh, the target value. And now again we split up the sum. Um, yeah, let me see. Yeah, we take uh, out of this sum, um, we take the term for r equal to p. For r equal to p, this is one term, and then we replace these two r's by p, and that's what we get here. Yeah? So we take out of the sum the term number p, and then of course the rest of the sum is for all terms uh, r uh, not equal to p. Okay, um, yes, and yeah. Let's look at this first sum here. Um, here we can see that this tpi does not depend on the index j, so we can, we can pull it uh, in front of the sum. That's what we have here. And now if we look at the rest of this sum, then what we have left is QJ times QJ. And this of course, this product here is equal to 1. Oh, let me see. Yeah, this product, this product is equal to 1. Um, and but it's the sum over n. Let me see. Why is this one? Die Bedingung für Autonormalität 
Oh yes, yes, you're right. Yeah, because the vectors are orthonormal. Yeah, because the vectors are orthonormal, and this is you're right. That's the the scalar product of one vector with itself. Yeah. So yes, that's exactly the orthonormality. So we get a one here, and um, yeah. Now let's look at the rest. Uh, so here we have this double sum over this product and now we can also move this ti in front of this sum and that's what we have here. Huh? And now here we have uh, we, here we have the scalar product of the vectors r and p for r not equal to p, that's important. Huh? And, uh, and uh, because of the autonormality, all these scalar products are zero, and so the rest of this term is zero, and you see we get an exact reproduction of our training patterns. Um, this only works if our patterns are autonormal, um, but I mean, the good thing with this proof is they don't need to be statistically independent. Huh? But, as I already told you, that if uh, the number of st stored patterns is large enough, then it also works very well with uh, uh, statistically independent uh, random patterns. Okay, yes, but a disadvantage of this model is the following. The disadvantage is actually the linearity if I really want to do pattern recognition, for example. Because the model is linear, that's because of this, that means our mapping from input to output is a continuous function. And a continuous function has a property that a similar input is being mapped onto a similar output. Huh? So s small changes in the input lead to small changes in the output. So then that means uh, that, for example, we suppose we have this memory mapping uh, pixel images onto names of persons. And now if the input pixel image is a little bit different from the person, and if the correct output would be Hans, and the input uh, image is a little bit different, then the output name is a little bit different like this or like that. And that's what we don't want to have. Huh? Um, so for such a purpose we need different uh, types of networks. Okay, ah yeah, okay, we will not look at this chapter pseudo-inverse because we will have this quite soon in mathematics. Now let's look at a different um, associative type of associative memory. Um, it's the so-called binary HEP rule, or sometimes also called the PALM model of an associative memory or neural network. And I present this here. I mean, this is not very popular, but it's, it's really nice because it is extremely simple. It is so simple that everybody would think this cannot work. It's impossible that this works, but it does work. Huh? Um, and it is, it is the same we just had. It is this um, matrix multiplication memory, but with binary input, uh, inputs and outputs. So as the input vectors, the Q1, Q2, and so on, they are just binary ve uh, vectors. And in order to make it uh, simpler here, so um, in such a vector there are zeros and ones, and I just draw the ones here, and all the, the empty fields, they correspond to zero values. Yeah? Um, okay. And now, um, what we have here, this is our weight matrix. This is our weight matrix. And I now I show you how this weight matrix is being trained. How did we compute the weight matrix before? Do you remember?
how was it in our linear model? We, may, we should write the formula on the blackboard. Let's go back. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, here we have it. Um, we, could, we could write it as a matrix. The weight matrix is the sum over all patterns P of Q, P, vector times T P vector. Huh? Is this is this correct? Let me see. Um, yeah. So we have this Q vector, QP vector, like this, and if our TP vector is this, then we get such a matrix. Yeah? So we have to use this as a column vector and this as a row vector, so we should transpose this in the vector notation. Yeah? So we just multiply all our input vectors with the output vectors. Here we take the column vector and here we the row vector and that's how we get this matrix. And uh, this is the same as this formula. Uh -huh. Yes? Okay, and now what happens here is, you see, it's quite similar. We have uh, the, oh yeah, okay, it's, it's actually just uh, transposed. So we have these Q vectors and here the T vectors. Okay, yeah, but I mean, it's, it's the same matrix, it's just transposed. So here we have uh, the, the first input vector here we have the first output vector and now what we do is we write a 1 into the matrix at all the positions. Now let's make a, uh, here we have the first input values and the first output values and now we get these ones in the matrix. In this first step this is the same thing we get here. So in this model we would get the same ones. And now we take the second input vector. Let's, let's make it blue. And the second output vector. And then we would get in our matrix these values, these ones. Um, and these ones. Um, yes. Okay, and the interesting thing is, of course, now these, these guys here. In the previous model, what would we have here? here? Would it be a 1? No, it would be a 2. Because it is the sum over all patterns. And here we would have a 2 also. Huh? But in this PAL model, the 1 remains. So the formula we use, if, if we look at the loop over all the patterns, we don't use a sum here, we, do, we just use a logical OR. So if there is already a 1, the 1 re, uh, will remain, 
um, if there would be no one like here, then of course we would get a one because one or zero is one. Okay, now let's do it with the uh, pattern number three. Um, we get the ones here and these ones and then we get a one here, a one here and the one here and these three. Okay. And of course at all these positions where we have multiple entries we kind of lose information. Huh? Because, I mean, this one is the same one as this one, so we don't know that this one comes from two different inputs and this one comes from one input. And when I saw this first, I thought this cannot work, it's impossible. But actually it does work. Um, and I will show this with an example. Oh no, before we go into the example, of course, we have to, we have to look at, I mean, this was, this here is the learning process. That's how this matrix is being determined. Okay, and what did we do? We stored these three input-output pairs in this matrix. And now the question is, is it possible to recall um, the, uh, these values from the matrix? Recall means for example, I input vector number Q1, I put input vector Q1, and I want to get as an output my target vector T1. And now let's look what happens. Yeah. So we, we have the same matrix, and now the inputs are these here. And what we get as an output, what we do now to compute the outputs is we just multiply our query vector on the matrix. So, uh, so then we get the sum of these two ones, which, is, which gives us a 2 as, out, as the output here. And of course we will get the sum of these two, uh, sorry, three ones which gives us a 3, and here we have uh, again three ones, which is a 3, and this gives us this one, which is 1, and the rest is 0. Okay, so now, but now we get some uh, kind of weird output, because only 1s and zeros are allowed as the output. Now, um, but the nice uh, thing is, if you go back to, um, to our training patterns, you see that the target output for the first query input would be um, yeah, these two ones here. Yeah, these two ones, that's what we want to get. And uh, so now if we look at these two uh, components of the output vector, you see they are the largest. Yeah? So if we use uh, here for this vector a threshold theta equal 3, that means we set the output to 1 if the value that we have is greater than or equal to 3, then we get, uh, so then this moves to the vector 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, and that's correct. Now let's look at uh, the second uh, training pattern. If we multiply the second training pattern with the matrix, we get these two threes, which leads to 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, which is correct again. And for the third, we get the ones here, uh, which is also correct. Yeah? If we go back to our previous example, um, you see that we get the correct outputs. So the question is, does this work all the time? Yeah? 
or is this just accidentally that it worked here? Uh, um, and again, there is a proof, Professor Palm, he did the proof, oh, actually many years ago, I, I guess it's at least uh, 20 to 30 years ago, he proved that if the number of patterns that you store are first random and second not too many, then um, it works. So the, the training patterns will be reproduced with very high probability. Um, yeah, I don't go into the proof now, but I show you, um, I show you an implementation, an example of this. Yeah? Um, yeah. I mean, this was, this was, uh, when was it? Oh, let's see. I, I think the, the software tells us. Yeah, you see, I wrote this program when I worked at Nixdorf in 1988. Yeah? Um, it's just a little simple C program. I mean, this is trivial uh, to compute this matrix with this uh, uh, bitwise OR and matrix multiplication. And now, in, um, when I start the program, in, it immediately stores all the patterns which are in some pattern file, and that's what you see here. Uh, this is uh, the list of, yeah, and I used it as an auto-auto-associator. Uh, so what I did is I used as input and output the same word. Uh, um, yeah. Display von meinem Computer. Achso, uh, nee, Display. Uh, this is, yeah. Wir können hier den, den Rollladen yeah. runterlassen. Das ist das Einzige. Okay, maybe you could do that. Oder die Konsole. Schwarzer Ach so, um, yeah, das können wir machen. Das stimmt. So, wo müssen wir das machen? Aktuelles Profil bearbeiten, oder? Bin ich? Ich habe Erscheinungsbild. Erscheinungsbild. Ah, ja, okay. Schwarz auf weiß. Okay. Okay, ist das besser jetzt? Ja, ja. viel besser. Ja. ja, genau. Gut, danke. Okay, so here in this list you see the training patterns. I mean, we can see more. I don't know, it's something like 50 stored words. And now we can give as input one of the patterns. Yeah? Um, let's, let's use Frank. And now what you see is you get three different outputs. So, I mean, this is a naive and really simple implementation. And what I did is I just try all the thresholds starting from the maximum threshold. Huh? And the maximum threshold is the number of columns that the matrix has. Yeah? Uh, I mean, of course, the output value from this matrix product cannot be bigger than the number of columns of the matrix. Huh? And the matrix has in... No, sorry. Um, what I did is, it's a little bit different. So, look at this matrix. The matrix has a number of columns, but now I multiply it with some input uh, vector, and uh, the value that we get here in the output vector cannot be bigger than the number of ones in the input vector. Yeah? So, if the one input, input vector has four ones, then I use as a, as a threshold theta 4. Uh, and that's what, what we did here. Uh. Um, why is the number of bits in the input 4? Because this word has uh, five uh, letters. Uh. And um, yeah, so. I will show you later. I will show you later how these inputs are encoded. Yeah? Um, but the maximum possible threshold is 4. So as the first threshold I try, 
I try 4. Uh, and you see I get Frank as an output and with the threshold 3 I get Franz as an output and you see Franz is also a stored pattern. Uh, it's a similar pattern and with, uh, if the threshold is too small then you get some crazy output. Yeah? And uh, let's look what happens if we use Franz as an input. We get two times Franz as output. Um, and now, you have any suggestions what should we use as an input? Oh, I never tried. What happens if I if I uh, write Franz in the in the reverse order? Anrin, that's nice, isn't it? Um, how about this? Okay, yeah, looks it doesn't work. Maybe we should take longer words, Christian. Okay, Christoppen. Ah, yeah, there is Christoph. Um, This works. I knew it would work. Um, yeah. What 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 do you want to see? How about this one? I just uh, remove the first character. It works. still works, even with the highest threshold. Oh. Still. Oh, that's nice. Christian. Ah. Okay. Okay, so you see it invents uh, new words. Um, so you see it, it works quite well as a spelling corrector and that's actually the purpose for such uh, auto-associative memories. Okay, no more questions? So we can go back to the slides. Now let's look how this example was implemented. Oh yes, go back to this, uh, to the binary HEP rule. So the, the training formula can be written in this way. WIJ, which is the weight uh, with these ind indices, it's no longer the sum over all patterns of this product, it's the OR conjunction. Huh? The logical OR of all the input patterns. Oh, there. Yeah, let's let me see. Um, ah, yeah. Okay, this is the slide. This is about our error correction program. Um, so the request vector, the the this input vector, um, has a length of 676 bits, which is quite long. Um, why? Because the encoding of our input, uh, we used quite a smart encoding, which is, you see, these are all the input values, and they, uh, they are all the pairs that I can construct from the 26 uh, characters in the alphabet. So from AA up to A, 
Z, B, A to B, Z, up to finally Z, Z. And these are 676, which is 26 uh, squared. Oh, this is a furchtbar heute. Also, jetzt probieren wir es mal nochmal am Hemd. So? Okay. Twenty-six squared is the number of input bits. Um, and why do we use this encoding? I mean, we could have used twenty-six input bits. That's actually what we do for the output. Uh, uh, what do we have? Yeah, here in the response vector t, all positions in the world are reserved with twenty-six bits. So what we use for the output is two hundred and sixty bits, which means for the first character in the output word, I have 26 bits. Uh, if it's a A, it's the first bit and so on, up to 26. Then for the second character, 26 bits. So we get uh, 260 bits for words with maximum length of 10. But in the input, uh, we just encode which pairs in the world do occur. So for the, for the input word Franz, we have this pair, this pair, this, and this. And you see, this is a word of length 5, so we have uh, 4 1 bits. Uh? At most, 4 1 bits. Uh? Um, for example, if we use the word Otto, uh, then we have this pair and this. Oh, yes, we have 3. What should we use? Um, so this is still um, yeah. If if the word would be, for example, um, a b a b, then we have this pair twice, and this pair. So we only have two pairs. So the number of inputs is at most the length of the word minus one. Okay, so our matrix has a size of 676 times 260, which is almost 200,000 bits, uh, which is quite large. Um, so if we um, if the number of patterns that we store in the matrix is small enough, then this is a sparse matrix. That means the number of ones in the matrix is not too big. Yeah? Um, what happens if in this matrix I would store, let's say, 100 million different words? How would the matrix then look like? Yeah, all ones. And then, of course, all information is lost. Yeah? So it's quite important that the matrix does not get too full. Yeah? Because then I lose all the information. But as long as the matrix is quite sparse, yeah? it, must, it, it doesn't need to be extremely sparse, but as long as there are enough zeros in the matrix, uh, there is enough information to reconstruct uh, our training patterns. Okay, and um, yes, let's go back one slide. Uh, here we see um, what is the time? Yeah. Um, so here we see the um, an analysis of the memory ca memory capacity. Professor Palm, in his PhD thesis, he proved that so if our matrix has m times n elements yeah, it's a, an m times n matrix uh, then one input output pair has altogether m plus n bits yeah? and uh, uh, the so the raw storage capacity of the matrix is m times n and now we look at this uh, ratio the the number of um, memorizable, so that's the number of bits I can store in, in the matrix uh, until uh, it does not work anymore. So 
So that's the maximum number of storable bits in the matrix divided by the number of memory cells. The number of memory cells is m times n and uh, the number of memorizable bits is the number of bits per word times the maximum number of words that I can store in the matrix. Huh? Um, and this is of course the, that's the ratio we, we are interested in. Huh? Um, and uh, Palm has shown that this ratio is less than or equal to um, the binary, uh, no, the, the, the natural logarithm of 2, which is 0.69. Uh, and that's not too bad. Um, a list memory, a classical list memory, has a 1 as this ratio. And here we have 0.69. So um, that's, uh, that's extremely good. I would never expect uh, for such a, an extremely simple uh, storage model to have uh, an, uh, we could say, an efficiency of 70% compared to the list memory. Okay, yeah, and here we have a comparison of um, the, the models we have seen already. The list memory has an alpha of 1. The, um, the associative memory with, so th that's what we have r seen right here, with the binary HEP rule has 0.69. The Cohorn and associative memory, which was the linear variant, has 0.72. And the Hopfield networks, they have 0.29 something. Yeah? So you see, uh, this extremely simple model is almost as good as our linear model where we store the exact values of the sums. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so much about this um, uh, simple uh, PAL model. And now I think we should have the break. Yeah, thank you. <coughs>